classes, which was, you know, a bunch of us that have different skills. We would come together, and for a weekend, we would welcome people from like readers that are keen to learn design, development, or how to write a novel or fiction, everything. So we would organize this for the, the entire two weekends. And this was like a very nice uh, income pro project for The Guardian. Everybody that wanted to come for a weekend would pay 300 pounds for the weekend, imagine, times 200 people per weekend. We would do this once a month. And I would, I love doing this because first of all, I would deal with lots of women that wanted to learn the craft and hopefully we could hire. <laughs> and secondly, because I love, I love uh, leading sessions for um, training, you know, because I love training myself. I, I love to get training. Um, so I started becoming the, the anchor of these events. I felt like very comfortable, even if it was in English, you know, and even if my English was very imperfect. People accepted, and it was all about connecting with people more than just being a perfect British accent, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I really loved that. And then I wanted to do this in Latin America. So I started saying to the Guardian, I want to do master classes in Latin America. Latin America really needs access to this kind of content that we're showing here because they have so many stories that are much way more critical than the stories we cover here that like lots of people die every day. How can we help them raise the game? <coughs> and then they said, no, it would be nice, but we don't understand Spanish, so we don't control very well. And I was like, but I, I understand Spanish, I can help you. No, 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 and I was 28 by then, so they were like, you are too young, chill out, you know, stay cool. <coughs> and then I was like, and we need to do something more to bring more women in, into the team. We were 180 developers. We, I'm not a developer, but I was working with developers. And there were three women, from which I was one of them. And I was like, this is, the men were very, very kind, inclusive and stuff, but at the end of the day, yeah. we are not represented. So I was like, we need to, to change this. Like, we are a newspaper. <laughs> we are talking to the world. And the world is made of 50% men, 50% women, across so many different religions and traditions and cultures. Uh, in terms of, of cultures, we had different cultures, especially Indians in London, uh, Africans, uh, and English, of course. Very, very few Latinos. Latins, very, very few. Maybe one or two. And I consider myself a Latina, despite the fact I'm Portuguese. We are the Latinos of Europe. But then when I came to work at Latin America, I really identified myself with Latin America, M maybe even more than with Portugal, because Portugal is like this mindset of, we cannot do it. And Latin, Latin America is like, we can do it, and we have to do it, you know? <laughs> we have to do it, otherwise we are screwed, you know? It's totally different kind of mentality. <laughs> so um, then my boss was hired to go to New York Times, and the thing, the strategy was like, he was going, and then after six months, I was going after to work with him. As soon as, and this is like disclosure, but as soon as he arrived there, the, the, tr the culture was so different from the Guardian. Guardian was open space, everybody super kind to each other, we tried to work together, I, you, you know? Well, because, well, I've been to London a lot, and people in London are a little more, they're like, open. nicer, open, like, you know, and in New York, everyone's very, like, yeah, tasked, right? like work, 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 so yeah. I can imagine it's Totally very, that. Yeah, and especially in Europe, that Europe, everything is green friendly, and like, like you said, like, there was windows, it's yes. like, you know. So, yeah. Exactly that. So he got the shock of culture when he got to the New York Times. You know, I'm very like loud and Latina, you know, or I want to be, yeah. you know. <laughs> when I was going to the garden with flowers and colorful clothes and everybody like, like uh, doing the thing, they, but they accepted. In New York, it's like you say, people are like, ta ta ta, workaholics. They don't look to the sides, they work in their silos and they look at you like this, you know. In the garden, people work barefoot and like people are, you know, very, very yeah. relaxed, very relaxed culture. So he did not, not enjoy the culture in New York Times. And he said, and I came to visit him in his second day. He's like, Mariana, we go out, you know, there's big, big uh, elevators. We go on the elevators. You want to shut up. You don't gesticulate and you don't open your mouth. Like, just behave because you, <laughs> you can put me in trouble. Here is not the garden. I was like, oh my God. So I arrived there. I had to sit in a place like this, not move my head a lot. Like, he made me feel like, don't be yourself at all. Yeah. And then I looked at him and he was stressed and tense and feeling judgment from everywhere. And I was like, wow, this is so uh, and cool. And he was like, yeah, I hate this. I'm so unhappy here. I don't feel any collaborative spirit. I feel like everybody's competing against each other and I'm an enemy to, to, to be killed by, by my colleagues. Like, oh. it's crazy. <laughs> and he's like, you're not gonna fit in this culture. I was like, yes, I couldn't. So right there I learned I could never, I think I could never learn at work at the New York Times if I want to be happy and not have tension in my shoulders, you know? 
So the plan was aborted. And he was like, yeah, I need, now I want to be here one or two years because of my visa, I'm applying for the green card, and, but this is not cool. And then along the time, we kept in contact a lot and he was just so unhappy, so unhappy. Like, he couldn't do the things he was doing. Like, basically at the Garden, he was a leader. When he got to the New York Times, he was one more. And of course, he wanted to be a leader, but he didn't mind to be one more and then get to the leadership by, because he deserves it. But he saw no space. All the doors were closed to him, you know? Like, no way you're going to move from here. So he was like, oh, this is really not cool. So he had a bit of a depression, actually. And you know, I was at the garden without my boss. So I lack, I lack the leadership and, and the guidance. He was the visionary, and he was guiding us. And all my team was feeling the same. And then all of a sudden, I applied to become the leader of my team. And I was 29 then, and I was Portuguese, and I was a girl. And then I applied, and in The Guardian, there is this rule that if you apply for internal jobs, you are, you are forced to have a, at least an interview to see, even to say you're not qualifying, mm -hmm. even that. But it's like an, a, a rule. <clears throat> so back then, I was really, really, really depressed that my boss left. And then my father passed away in the same, around the same time. So I was really sad and I was like, I, then I was living at the garden. You know, I actually had a boyfriend at home, but I didn't even want wanted to be with him. You know, I just wanted to forget about everything because I, I lost the two leaders of my life, which was my father and my, and my boss. Well, my boss I didn't lose, but he was not there to guide me anymore. And then I applied for this job and immediately two hours after I applied, I got this email saying, you don't qualify, you're not, you're not gonna take this job. I was like, what? And I, I, I forwarded that to HR and said, what? There is the rule of the Guardian that says I am granted an interview. Why am I given two hours immediately after I applied that I'm not even gonna get an interview? And I tried to like do a process about it because right now I was ready to fight that fight because what is wrong with me, you know? What's the system uh, blocked here? So I found a little bit of a corruption there. I don't know. I couldn't explain how and why and who. So I brought that to HR. Not many people took very much care of it. And then my boss, which at the time, it's the same CTO now at The Guardian called uh, Tanya Cordry, And she's a woman. And I was like, why? You should understand me. Like, why don't I get the interview? She's like, you don't qualify. <coughs> it's just like a waste of time. I was like, what? Really? It, it, it broke my heart and I was like, mm, okay, so I started, sorry, I had to just, just to the microphone. Um, I started to become very like, mm, so this is not as clean as I thought it was. I started to wake up because my boss there, he was making my life easy, solving me all the problems, mm -hmm. and now it was time for me to stop being naive and learning. So I was like, mm. So I told my boss, he was like, just uh, go for it until the end, ask it. And then suddenly they put someone from another department, a man that was there for the last 25 years. And at the Guardian, they have this, uh, it's a union, so they cannot fire no one. People have to voluntarily leave. And there was this like down, down moment where they asked 100 people to leave. <coughs> of course, they would be given the money, but they would have to leave the Guardian. So this guy was put to lead my team. And this guy came from print. He knew nothing about interactive. And he was not the leader and the visionary that we wanted to have in my team. Everybody left my team. Everybody quit. And there was there me. And I was like, OK, this is so bad. Like, I love The Guardian, but this is not where I want to be. I don't feel challenged. I don't feel I'm learning. And I don't feel this, this gentleman is g leading us at all. We are stopped in time. And then. Guess what? I got this was New Year, and I got the International Center for Journalists to write me an email and say, "Look, we saw your work at the Guardian. We would like to know if you'd like to work in Latin America, and do something like in the terms that you are doing." I was like, "This is uh, heaven, you know. This is sent from heaven to me to help me." And I was like, "You know what?" I'm, so I took one entire day. It was vacation for a Christmas vacation. And I I wrote an entire page with my own. I'm not an editor, so I don't know how to write like properly perfect English. So I, I write very orally style. My thing is more visual. And I wrote my oral style and saying this is the things I want to do. And then they came back to me, they interviewed me and they say, you got it. <laughs> so basically, they told me to put all my dreams in a page. And I wrote like six or seven dreams that I had. One of them was to create a corpus of women, editor, like journalist women that needs, that want to become more digital savvy. A little bit of what happened to me when I went to Stockholm, I became a little bit more digital savvy. And then everything I learned back in Berlin that women need to have a voice. And third, that ne women need to have leadership skills and not be passed by whatever system is in place. So all of those things, I was like, I am a woman. 
I'm exactly the case scenario for this thing, but in Latin America, I'm sure there's a ton of women like me, which are forced not to believe they can go forward and never like have a hard time managing salaries and speaking up and getting their rights r for themselves. And that I are disconnected for technology like I was. I want to work in those terms. And then I created Chicas Poderosas, which you know what is this, right? So it's exactly this. It's uh, how can I, and, and everything based on my mentor, what he did to me, both at, at the Universal, like my mentor that gave me the DVDs, mm -hmm. that was his German style of teaching me, and my English mentor that sat with me and taught me everything how to do design. So those two case scenarios that these guys devoted their time to me made me be here now talking with you, right? Otherwise I wouldn't because they trust me and they, they, and of course I took everything in that they gave me. Of course we need to be receptive, but the, the, the thing that they devoted their time to teach me was unpayable. No money pays that. So Chicas Podras is exactly that. And how I do it, I bring people that I, I've worked with from different newsrooms. It can be New York Times, uh, not very often we have New York Times, but now we have women from New York Times video department that are amazing. And uh, The Guardian, NPR, ProPublica, you name it, like big newspapers, both in US and in Europe, that are doing great stuff. And now more and more in, in, in Latin America, they are doing great stuff that I know the people personally, on the personal level, and I know they are good trainers. And I ask them to come to Latin America. I, I get the funding. I do the project. I write the proposal for, for our sponsors. I, need, I say I need $10,000 to fly these three folks and to uh, get them accommodation and food for three or four days. Then these people come and they mentor for three or four days without me having to give them a salary, you know, which is a very important point. This is an NGO. Like, it's not for profits. All the money I get is to pay the costs. Mm -hmm. And then we get together a group like this maybe from 80 to 100, 150 people. Usually like, it's targeted to women, but lo some men can, which is, I think, very interesting because this conversation cannot be only happening in, among women. We need to involve men into changing this aspect ratio, we, uh, aspect, uh, gender <laughs> ratio, sorry. <laughs> gender ratio and the, the, the way women are treated in any part of these situations need to change. Like, we need to be equally treated, right? So at least this is what I believe in. You know, I, I wish sometimes being a woman uh, stops you from having access to c certain opportunities. But on the other hand, sometimes being a woman really helps. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. Really helps. Especially we are more empathetic than men. <laughs> I'm sorry, usually. <laughs> and and uh, we are more emotional connected. Uh, and that's really important. And I think especially in journalism. I, I think in everything, but in journalism in specific. But why am I, for instance, I don't know my male companies, my male colleagues, how much they make. You know, I'm sure they know how much I make, but I'm sure they make more than I do. Not that I, I care for that. If I do the same, I want to be paid the same, not because I have boobies, not very big, but I have boobies, <laughs> that it makes a difference, you know? Like, it, it needs to not be a, a difference making. If it's all about skills, all about uh, how, what you bring to the company, you should not be get, le get less paid because, by assumption, women are less what, less professional or less capable or what, you know. So I want to change that, starting with myself. And then, secondly, I w I wanted to train women uh, to become what I want to be in my life, and what maybe they want to be or whatever they want to be. I want to help them get there. So Chicas Poderosa started in Chile. And it was me going to Hacks and Hackers events, but instead of naming it Hacks and Hackers, naming it Chicas Poderosas. We had 120% more women attendance. It was a room full of women and, you know, a handful of men. In difference, like from Hacks and Hackers chapters, which is like 95% men and five women that know how to code, all the other women that wanted to attend, they think, mm, my skills are not good enough. Maybe I'm going to be judged. I'm gonna, they're going to make fun of my lack of skills. Like, I'm not going out there. You know, it's not comfortable. So Chicas Padras is exactly the place for women to feel comfortable with whatever skill level they have. It's from zero to 100, everybody can help each other. So we do trainings, like we bring these mentors from, for instance, I remember now, NPR. We have Brian Boyer and Kainaz, which are leaders of the visuals team. And they come and they say how they did, for instance, this project called the Planet Money. All the steps, so we have designers, developers, journalists, editors, and then people thinking how to tell the story, putting always the user in first place. So all of these are insights that are really, really meaningful that, okay, you can Google and learn some of this, but like in person, it makes so much difference. 
Then after they talk, they come sit with you in the table and we have a project that we all want to do together and they are there working with us as part of the team. So you just learn how to do the things the way they did, which is one way that you can copy and replicate or you can adapt and make your own strategy to do these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. So it, it has been amazing. Now it's like two and a half years. Today, before coming here, I was just posting a, uh, for Peru. It's starting now, like as we speak, Peruvian uh, session of uh, chapter of Chicas is starting. Uh, and they're going to train women how to do reporting on elections and trying to track uh, where the bad, the bad parts are, bad connections, uh, corruption, everything. So they are on top of things, you know. And so Latin America took me one year. So I was one, one year as a fellow of International Center for Journalists, which I recommend you guys to see. International Center for Journalists. They have fellowships all over and ICFJ. And if you want to have me as a reference, please use me as much as you want. And so they, they, they ha had me as a fellow in Latin America. I worked across mostly, almost every country of Latin America except Suriname and those, you know, those ve very small countries by, by Venezuela. Um, but major like the Ch Chile, Brazil, Venez um, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Uruguay. Um, so it was like I was just there doing these trainings uh, for one day or two or three and then now then I after that I got hired by Fusion and when, when they called me I was in Costa Rica and my boss called me so would you like to come to Miami and work uh, first of all it was work at Univision one year before and I was like I just got this fellowship I'm going to Latin America so I would love to, but I can't. I'm going to the fellowship. Okay, we talk in a year when your fellowship finishes. So after one year, they called me and they said, no, actually, we're starting a new channel called Fusion, which is for a younger audience, millennials that are digital savvy. Would you like to come and work for us? I was like, mm, I was so happy in Latin America. I was really so happy. First of all, I felt for the first time I was contributing, like deeply contributing. In The Guardian, I felt like I was no longer contributing a lot. But when I went to Latin America and I was working in different newsrooms, I felt people wanted to hear my opinion. And I, that was so valuable. I was like, wow, I have so much things that I learned there that I took it for granted. But now that you ask me, I can tell you and explain how we did. And it's valuable for other people, you know? So I was working in Costa Rica in a, in a paper called La Nación. And we just did for the first time the first cross uh, departments project. So we got together in a table like this, like 20 of us from different departments, from business, fashion, culture, na -na -na -na, environment, come together, journalists, developers, and designers to come up with new ways of storytelling. Then we had the Obama visit there, and we did an interactive about it with video. It was so cool, you know? And they love to work together because you become so much stronger if you have the opportunity to, to work with people with different skills from you that can really empower the entire story. So that was awesome. And people start winning awards. And you know, I feel so proud because I didn't touch the projects, they did. But you just open a little door for them to win awards. And they could have won awards without you, but you just open the door. You know, and I felt so, so good. You know, I was like, I feel like I'm useful here, so I want to live here. And then they said, okay, come to Miami. I was like, I never dreamed about you working in the US. It's again, another dream that I never dared to dream. Because I always thought I would never get the visa, you know? It's a big thing for us uh, from abroad, wanting to come work here. The visa is uh, the, either you, they always tell you marry an American guy, but it's like, it's not that easy, right? <laughs> I think, I think, at least for me, like, <laughs> anyway. So when they said that, I was like, wow, that's amazing. But you know what? I now, after one year of fellowship, I, I've, I've worked with so many people across the, the world, like across Latin America, that I really wanted to work more. I just go and I played like I played hard to get because I was really happy, ha really happy. I didn't have, I didn't have to say yes. I didn't have to please them. So I was like, I just go if I can have my own team, the of people that I've been working with. And they said, okay, you can have your own team. So my team in my list was like five men, five women, myself. Guess what? Th they gave me the yes. They would do everything they could to bring my team, which means visas for everybody. I start interviewing the first five women. Every girl told me no because of whatever reason. One, don't want to move to Miami. Two, second, I'm pregnant. Third, she was too young to get the visa because if you are like 21 years old, it's very hard to give you a visa. Another one didn't want to do interactive storytelling. And another one, I forgot what. And then I interviewed the other five boys. All of them said yes immediately. I end up with the team with five boys and myself. Now, finally, we got another girl f that we hired recently. We took her from the Sun Sentinel. But you know, I felt so frustrated. I was like, 
why this is like, you know, but I understand, like, I'm single, my family is in Portugal, and I have no attachments. I can move from city to city, and I've been, as you see, moving very lightly. But with people, when, when they have families, it's a little bit harder. And it's not just up to the woman to decide if they want to move or not, because the man as well t takes their, his job. And if they have babies, it's even more complicated. So I found that, wow, this is amazing, amazingly hard. So I just kept on dedicating my life to Chicas Poderosas, which is like, there we have like hundreds of women, very talented, ready to, to, to take it, either from their countries or even moving abroad. Now Univision is hiring maybe five Chicas Poderosas because of Chicas Poderosas. So it's not directly to me, but at least they are, they are getting uh, into Fusion Univision group. Did you give you time at work to work on that? So when I signed the contract, I was like, okay, one contract that I want is like, I need to keep going with Chicas Poderosas because this is my baby project. I would, until the, the, the end of my life, I want to dedicate if Chicas is alive. And uh, the contract was like, okay, you can go three times per year into events, you know? And I either take holidays or, like, my life has just been so crazy that I never faced yet that moment that I say, I'm going to Chicas. And they say, no, it never happened. Uh, basically, um, I did... So after that, I got hired, and my, my five guys got hired. Uh, 